Hi, I'm Jim Lee, co-publisher of DC Entertainment. Thanks for joining us as we celebrate the legacy of Neil Gaiman's The Sandman by looking back at how the series changed the comic book industry forever. In December of 1988, DC Comics released the first issue of The Sandman, Neil Gaiman's spellbinding story of the Lord of Dreams would captivate readers worldwide as it unfolded over the next eight years. The saga begins in 1916, when a group of occultists attempt to conjure and trap death. They are disappointed, however, when they capture what appears to be a tall, thin, pale-skinned man instead. Not death, but dream, sometimes known as Morpheus, the being who rules over the dreams of all things. The first story arc, illustrated by artists Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg, told the story of how Dream regained his power by retrieving his totems, a bag of sand, a ruby, and a bone and glass helm. The growing readership was shocked and delighted by a journey that took them into gothic visions of hell, the darkness of drug addiction, and an unforgettable issue set in a 24-hour diner from which its patrons could not escape. The first Sandman signing took place in December of 1988 at Jim Hanley's Universe on Staten Island. Only a dozen people showed up. Neil expanded the Sandman's world in an ever more complex tapestry by blending literature, myth and legend in new ways and introducing memorable characters like the Corinthian, Fiddler's Green, and Lucian the Librarian, steward to the Dreaming's library of unwritten books. By the end of the first arc, Preludes and Nocturnes, we learn that Morpheus is one of the seven siblings known as the Endless, each an anthropomorphic representation of an aspect of existence. It would take another three years until we encountered them all. Destiny, death, dream, the twins, desire and despair, the missing destruction, and the youngest, the strange delirium. The Sandman issue number 19, A Midsummer Night's Dream, illustrated by Charles Vess, made history when it won the World Fantasy Award for Best Short Story 1991, making it the first comic book to ever win an award for prose fiction. The following year, Neil did another signing tour for The Sandman, this time for Volume 4, Season of Mists, which chronicles Dream's Odyssey as the ruler of hell after Lucifer quits. At one stop alone, the signing drew over a thousand readers. And something new was happening for comic stores at the time. About half of the people reading Sandman were women. Initially, the Sandman was published under the DC Comics imprint, but its mature content was a far cry from Superman, Batman, and the Teen Titans. The popularity of the Sandman, as well as the other mature titles in the DC library, overseen and edited by Karen Berger, needed a place where experimentation and complex themes were the rule instead of the exception. As a result, the Vertigo imprint launched with a host of new, reimagined DC characters, a few creator-owned series, and the release of The Sandman number 47 in January of 1993. That same year, Neil expanded the Sandman mythos by writing the first spin-off miniseries, Death, the High Cost of Living, with art by Chris Pacello and Mark Buckingham. A second miniseries, called Death, the Time of Your Life, was released three years later by the same art team. But nothing lasts forever, not even the most critically acclaimed comic of its time, Sales continued to rise, but Neil had always been clear that this was a story that would have a definitive end. The penultimate storyline of the series, The Kindly Ones, marked the beginning of the end for the Dream King, culminating with Morpheus' funeral in the 10th volume of the series, titled The Wake. This marked the final issue of the series, The Sandman number 75. In addition to Neil's remarkable story, each volume of The Sandman features a changing roster of world-class artists, including P. Craig Russell, Kelly Jones, Charles Vess, Malcolm Jones III, Brian Talbot, Jill Thompson, Mark Hempel, and Michael Zuli, to name just a few. This was a deliberate creative decision made to help each story feel unique through the changing art styles. But one artist remained consistent from the first issue to the last, cover artist Dave McKean. Dave's innovative cover designs combined paint, photography, and topography into a physical collage unlike anything in the industry and continually reinvented the look of Sandman redefining what could be allowed on a comic book cover at the time. While the grand saga of Morpheus that had begun in Sandman 1 and finished in Sandman 75 was done, the story of Dream was not over. Neil still had many stories to tell, including the prose novella, The Dream Hunters, illustrated by legendary Japanese artist Yoshitaka Amano in 1999, and released as a comic book adaptation by P. Craig Russell in 2007. An Endless Nights in 2003, which featured a cavalcade of international superstar artists, with each story focusing on one of the seven members of The Endless. In 2013, celebrating Sandman's 25th year, the Sandman Overture brought another artist to Morpheus' world, J.H. Williams III, as well as Neil's return to the universe he helped create. The bar for Sandman was raised even higher with a truly mind-blowing cast of characters. 
It's a story in which Morpheus literally holds the fate of the universe in his hands. And we learn that sometimes an ending is just another beginning, as the events from Sandman Overture act not just as a prequel, but they lead us directly into the first volume of the original series. The Sandman Overture sheds new light on the entire canon, allowing the seeds Neil planted 25 years ago to flourish today. Now in 2015, the imprint that the Sandman heralded is launching a staggering 12 new series from the top writers and artists in comics. Vertigo continues its tradition of breaking the boundaries of storytelling and pushing limits of both genre and medium with stories that explore the darkest corners of the human mind, reimagine ancient mythologies anew, reinvigorate the mundane, and test the mores of the times. The Sandman has been celebrated by countless fans, creators, and academics alike. It has found its way onto the syllabi of college professors around the world, and it will continue to influence and inspire many more as it has sold millions of graphic novels and has been translated into over a dozen languages. It challenges us. It enlightens us. And like all good stories, no matter how many times you've read it, each time you read it, it gives you something new. I am Jim Lee, co-publisher of DC Entertainment. Thanks for joining. A wonderful collaboration among Community Bookstore, Brooklyn Public Library, and con Congregation Beth Elohim. Uh, I'm Ezra Goldstein. I'm the co-owner of uh, Community Bookstore, but tonight, uh, I think I know how Rabbi Timoner feels on Yom Kippur. Uh, captive audience, this is my big chance for that sermon I've been waiting to give. <laughs> well, not to worry, the only sermon I'm going to give is uh, some instructions on uh, the signing line after the event. Uh, Neil will sign, he'll sign forever till everyone gets uh, the book signed that they want, but we ask that you stay seated after the event and we will call you row by row. You don't need to rush to the front, everybody will get a chance. And if you haven't gotten your book yet, you can buy it as you're standing in the signing line. We'll be selling books here on the side. Um, if you don't want to wait in the signing line, we will have pre-signed copies for sale outside in front of the uh, temple. So you have many, many options and lots of time, so please settle in and get comfortable. Uh, my other job tonight is to introduce Juno Diaz, who... Uh, 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 Juno, uh, in turn, will introduce Neil Gaiman. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Juno, if you don't already know. He was born in the Dominican Republic, grew up in New Jersey, <laughs> graduated from Rutgers University, and, uh, and has won more awards than, uh, he asked me to keep it short, he said one line will do, but uh, you know, you can't do Juno in one line. Um, he wrote Drowned, he wrote The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, which <laughs> won the Pulitzer Prize in 2008 and was a uh, National Book Critics Circle Award winner. Uh, this is How You Lose Her was a National Book Award finalist. He is a MacArthur genius. Uh, how many of those do we get to hang out with? Um, he's won the Penn Malamud Award, the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Penn O'Henry Award. He is currently fiction editor at Boston Review and the Rudge and Ansi Allen Professor of Writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So let's welcome Juno and Neil to Brooklyn by the Book. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we know what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> it's Neil Gaming Gang. So. Uh, allow me to do the formalities. First of all, we wanted to thank everyone who made this happen. Yeah, all the folks who put this together, all the folks at DC, yeah, uh, all the folks here, and of course, all of you who came this evening. We appreciate your presence here. Yeah. Um, keep it super brief. Dang, uh, you know how some people pretend they're not reading off of shit? <laughs> like, that's not me, so 
I'm gonna spend the entire time looking like I'm reading shit while Neil's talking. So, if you want smooth, there's plenty of other places for it, but this ain't happening, all right? So, um, let me just be brief so we can get Neil here. Um, Neil Gaiman, winner of the Newberry and Carnegie medals, winner of four Hugos, two Nebulas, one World Fantasy Award, four Bram Stoker's Awards, six Locus Awards, two British Science Fiction Awards, one British Fantasy Awards, three Geffens. My man wrote a Doctor Who script. Uh, my man, now for the real nerds, my man wrote a Babylon 5 script. Babylon 5, yeah. He's the author of Good Omens, Neverwhere, Stardust, American Gods, Coraline, Anansi Boys, The Graveyard Book, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, The Wolf on the Walls, Smoke and Mirrors, and most recently, Trigger Warnings, yeah. One of the most important fantasists and comic writers ever, yeah. And a talent so singular, versatile, and original that it defies description. Please help me in welcoming Neil Gaiman. <laughs> Neil, they're yours. I, I wanted to... First, it's great as always to see you again, Neil. And I kind of just wanted to get one selection, uh, one question. How many people here were born after the first issue of Sandman? <laughs> 1989, for those of you who don't know. How many were born after 1989? Actually, December 1988, the first one came out. It had a January 1989 cover date. But you had to be there to know that actually it was in the stores. Before. And I was there, but I smoked my memory away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Sandman's children, many of them here. <laughs> many of them here. Neil, I kind of wanted to begin first off. You've got a new baby, Anthony. I do. How's it going? Um, it's, it's wonderful. Um, he's just over there. And we're calling him Ash instead of Anthony because we named him Anthony after a friend of ours who died and died very recently and it just got a bit strange when we were saying, so we'll be going to Anthony's memorial and you go, no, actually, let's, let's give him a little name that's just, and he's small. So um, he's, he's wonderful and um, I'm loving this. I, I didn't expect it. Certainly when I married Amanda, um, the idea that we would do the breeding thing was not high on the list of things we were going to be doing. Um, but it's become, it's really beautiful. It's, it's, and also because I have been a dad, and because I was a dad 30 years ago and, and was last did the father to a baby thing 21 years ago, I know how ridiculously fast this goes. And as a result of which, I'm treasuring all of it, even the bits that you're not meant to treasure. <laughs> so when I'm crawling out of bed at four o'clock in the morning to change a diaper, uh, nappy for anyone watching this in England, um, <laughs> I'm going, this is wonderful, treasure this. It does not last for long, it zooms. And the... Uh the absolute tedious question about how's it, it, how's the whole new baby with your work? What's the relationship there? Um, pretty good. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to a couple of things. I'm definitely looking forward to stealing from him. <laughs> um, because as, as you say, I am a Newbery and Newbery medal, Carnegie medal winning author, and all of my good ideas were absolutely nicked from my children. Um, 
just because I would shut up and listen. And, you know, I'd go upstairs and one of them would be crying and she'd say, Dad, wolves came out of the walls and they took over the house. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, oh darling, you were, you were dreaming. <laughs> and she'd say, no, I can show you the place in the wallpaper they came out from. And I'd go, oh, okay. I'm using that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> And, and wrote a book called Wolves in the Walls, and all of them. So I'm, I figure, as he grows, I will get another career as a children's author. <laughs> um, and I'm hugely looking forward to that. But it's going to be, um, it, it's, it's a balancing act, and it's always gonna be a balancing act. Um, Amanda, who has been the hardest working person that I have known since, we first met has, for the very first time ever, gone, right, I'm taking a year off, and I'm just being a mum. And she's doing it. And I'm, I keep going, hang on. And I keep expecting her to come in and say, I got bored, so I've organized a world tour, but don't worry. <laughs> um, but so far, she hasn't. She's really doing it. And I have said, well, then I am going to take a year off, and I'm not going to do any more public, ex public events of any kind. This is, I think, my anti-penultimate public <laughs> event. Um, and 2016, I am just a writer. And I'm retiring from anything for a year other than going back and, and being a novelist. And, uh, you know, if you send me emails in 2016, they probably won't get replied to. <laughs> is this... This sort of, you have an enormous audience. You have an enormous audience worldwide. Is that part of the temptation that keeps one from work for you? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge, when you start out, you actually have to learn as a writer to be lonely. Um, being lonely is a thing that happens because it's just you and a piece of paper. And even if you fill that piece of paper and you're filling the room with people in your head. It's still lonely. Um, and it's so much more fun to go out in public and do stuff because it doesn't matter how funny the joke you just made on the paper is. The room is gonna be just as silent once you've made it. Um, but if you come out here and you say something funny, People will laugh or they will gasp. You do a, public readings of fun, public events, are, they're, they're glorious. And I love doing them. Um, but I'm also now really looking forward to becoming a hermit crab and uh, crawling into my shell, uh, possibly writing sometimes like that with a baby on one arm, uh, you know, a room of his own. It'll be fun. God, Neil, God, okay. No. <laughs> Nah, you're the man, dude. You are the man. Uh, I sent out questions, you know, I sent out a bunch of, you know, queries to my, my students and my friends, and um, I was like, yo, what do you want uh, to ask Neil Gaiman? And again, you say, you ask your friends for questions, and they just come back with statements. And so, of course, one of the statements was about Neil's, you know, fatherhood, and they said, my man is not shooting blanks, one. <laughs> Two, the second thing that came back for Neil, which was like kind of hilarious, was about Neil being here in Brooklyn. And they're like, oh, Neil Gaiman, he's coming to Brooklyn, the capital of green cards. And for tonight, he's officially our president of having a green card, you know? So both of those things, of course, I'm sitting here carrying in my head. I'm like, let me get these out before we get to work. <laughs> and it's true, I still have my green card. Every now and then people say, why don't you get American citizenship? You've been here over 20 years. And I go, if the queen found out, she might get hurt. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want, she's had a rough life. <laughs> uh, Anthony, dual citizenship? Anthony, dual citizenship, yes. Lucky yes. bastard. <laughs> well done. Well, I, let's get to work, gang. Let's get yeah. to it. I wanted to kind of go right back. I mean, um, Sandman Overture, you end at the beginning. 
Yeah. Um, and I want to sort of start in that kind of direction. Um, basically, when you started Sandman, um, it's been now, you know, we're looking at God a very long time. Um, I was 26 when I started writing Sandman, when I, when I plotted the first, when I got the idea for the thing, plotted the first eight ep episodes, wrote the outline, I was 26 years old, I will be 55 tomorrow. So it's been 29 years of my life. Fuck. Um, <laughs> and it was, um, and, and it's been easily the biggest thing that I've ever written. Um, Sandman is, what, two and a half thousand pages by now. Um, and it was really strange coming back to it. When I started out, I had no idea what I was doing, which was brilliant. Because when you have no idea what you're doing, you are making it up as you go along. You and not avoiding anything because people don't do that because you don't know what people do and people don't do. And the only thing that I had going for me was going, okay, I don't know how to write superhero comics, but maybe I can write something that does the stuff that I think that I can do. The fantasy stuff, the history stuff, the weird Zelazny-ish God stuff. I could, I could take all that and make it look a bit like a superhero comic just for long enough that they'd let me actually have this thing published. And then maybe if it gets an audience, they won't cancel it. <laughs> so that was, that was my plan. That was just bring out this thing. Um, I plotted it for eight issues. And the reason I plotted it for eight issues was I knew at that time in DC's history, they let comics run for a year. And I was quite certain that when issue eight came out, they would have the sales figures on the first five or six issues in. It would be a um, minor critical success and a major commercial flop. And Karen Berger, my lovely, wonderful editor, would break the news to me gently that I had another four issues to go. And what I would do is I would write four short stories, and that would be that. So that was what I, that was my, not my best case scenario, but what I expected. Because it's almost hard to remember, like when you look at sort of the audience that's here, the audience that sort of adores. Sandman and Adores You, it's almost hard to remember that that audience hadn't coalesced yet. That the, what you were doing was as much an act of faith as about anything that I've seen in the creative enterprise. The weirdest thing um, about the people is if, if you all look around and look at the other people who are here, um, you will notice one very important way in which about 50% of you are different from anybody who was buying comics in 1988. <laughs> and, and that was the first thing that was really strange because I really wanted to write comics that would include women, would have female characters who were not just men with, with watermelons strapped onto their chests and big guns. Um, I liked the idea of, I had, all, I had this weird grand scheme that shouldn't have worked because it, it, it was things like, okay, um, I'm going to do a monthly comic that will actually have a giant overall story and I want it to finish when I'm done. And nothing like that had ever happened before in mainstream comics. If you had a commercial success, then when you as a writer left, another writer came in and would suddenly decide that actually, okay, now Morpheus is gonna live, you know, in New York and drive the Sandmobile or whatever. 
Um, but that, you know, my whole giant weird plan um, actually happened. Everything worked. Looking back on it, it worked because I had brave, wonderful people working with me. I had Dave McKean uh, doing the covers and just <laughs> and creating a look that nobody had seen before and being my hardest critic. And I had Karen Berger, who had absolute faith in me. Um, and a lot of the time, no idea what I was doing, but was certain that I should be left alone to do it. <laughs> and that was amazing, because she would run interference, because, and she was also there when I got stuck. And probably, you know, five times during the whole of Sandman, I would phone her up and say, what should I do? How does this work? And, and she would always be the voice of reason. So that, I think, was definitely hugely one of the things that, that worked. But it was impossible. And because I didn't know that it was impossible, we pulled it off. The, was it partially sort of the kind of insane ambition of it? Was it partially, do you think, was it just you? Or do you feel like it was part of the zeitgeist? When I think about what's happening, you've talked about this a little bit, when people say, oh, Zahanaman, it's so extraordinarily singular. And you've said before, well, you know, there was a bunch of us doing crazy shit yeah. in those years. When I think about Miller, Moore. Absolutely, and they went before me, I mean, you know, Frank and Alan were my inspiration, just as Art Spiegelman was my inspiration, just as the Hernandez is, just as Dave Sim was my inspiration. You know, these guys were off doing weird stuff, and I was going, this is great. Um, but I think, it, novels are wonderful. I love novels. I love writing novels, I love making novels, but there was definitely a feeling that I had, that if I was going to write a novel, I was looking at a world in which people had been writing things like novels for about 3,000 years. And there were some really good ones. <laughs> and a lot of territory was inhabited. But in the 80s, there was this sudden realization that we could do comics that were just mature. You know, we had this tagline for mature readers. And it, it meant whatever we wanted it to mean. It didn't have to mean the sort of the underground comics thing of, of sex and drugs. Um, it didn't have to mean anything other than we could tell our stories. And for me, looking out at that point at the world of comics, it was obvious that there were huge areas of jungle. Just nobody had gone there. It had grown up, it was a wasteland, and I could take my machete, and I could go out and hack my way into stuff that literally nobody had done before. And that, there was chutzpah to that, um, but there was also a feeling of real excitement. I remember reading my first few Swamp Things, looking at Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, and going, you are doing material here that is as powerful and as interesting and as real as anything that anybody is doing out there in film, on the theater stage, in prose, and you're doing it in comics. And if you can do that, that means I'm allowed. And that was enormously liberating. I was, uh, again, I was getting those individual issues of Swamp Thing um, when I was a kid. And you've spoken about how important those issues were, that run, uh, Moore's run. What do you think specifically, do you have a sense now with this kind of the fullness of, in the fullness of time, do you have a sense of what specifically was just so striking, what specifically for you just became very generative 
in Moore's work in Swamp Thing? I think it's not the stuff that I thought it was at the time. At the time, what I thought was so brilliant were um, the use of words to comment on pictures and pictures to comment on words and the narrative flow and flow back and the clever things that he could do with panels and the possibly slightly overwritten but always perfectly written and beautifully written captions and the, the and I and now I look back and I go no it was the heart it was the fact that I felt these people were real not as comic book characters but as people he imbued them with life and he cared about them and you could feel him caring about them all the way through the paper and it was coming back to you so, and i've always wondered about that because you know usually when people talk about neil gaiman's work they talk about the fantasist that neil gaiman is and i'm always struck about your or i'm struck by your preoccupation with even in the most sort of the most kind of insane imaginative leaps your real singular focus on what we would call the human on that sort of who are these people what are they suffering what are they thinking this at the beginning of sandman or did it take time for you to realize that that was going to be it that you were going to be more preoccupied with who and what dream who dream is and what is his sort of what's his struggle and less with sort of the the kind of plots and fictions and conflicts that usually consume most comic books and certainly most comic books in that period well a lot of that was because i'm rubbish at that stuff <laughs> um you know people say you're not very good at big blowout endings you're great at ones that kind of fall apart a bit and, and I go yes that's what I'm good at good at that yes um, it, it's sort of that, that thing where you try and make a virtue out of your failings um, but it's also because what I wound up caring about the more I wrote the more I wrote Sandman was just the people and I would occasionally come up with plots that I was proud of and but Plots always felt to me like things which, if they worked well, they should feel organic. You don't ever want to really see the, the, the gears um, turning. You don't want to see the giant cogwheels of the plot. For me, you know, Alan Moore's Watchmen was wonderful, but I would have happily taken 30 issues of nothing much happening, these, these characters wandering around and making love and getting into trouble and being sad and irritating each other instead of the giant ha ha here is the plot and these people and there's a giant monster and now and ha ha i did it half an hour ago and you're going now you know um and it was wonderful but it felt suddenly like being i'd actually cared about these people and suddenly in the last issue of watchman i felt like i was being jerked back into the reminder that no actually this is a it's a machine to tell you a story and this is the story you're being told and so i think in sandman i definitely tried to make a virtue out of the fact that i'm rubbish at plots it also seems i mean again just from an outside reader it also seems you're not all that interested in indulging in bizarre power fantasies i mean when i look at your books almost everything that you've written i think you're you seem incredibly interested in the consequences of people wielding or having run into power but i i don't find you doing what a lot of folks in traditional comics are doing where there's a lot of indulging in power for power's sake i think some of that is because when i first discovered comics and particularly when i first discovered marvel comics i was about seven years old and i loved I, I discovered them first in these english reprints with names like wham smash pow fantastic and terrific 
and uh, by Odom's Press. And then um, I actually was given a box filled with, with original Marvel comics, some DCs, and I would read them and I would love them. But I started to notice that in comics, the superhero who could hit you the hardest won. And that mostly you could tell who was right and who was wrong in the story because the one who says, gets knocked through a wall, says, now you've made me really angry and gets back and hits everybody is the winner. And I'd go, but in my experience as a seven-year-old, the people <laughs> who hit me, um, I'm always the one that stays down. <laughs> And they won, but I'm not sure that actually made them good, and I don't think it solved anything. And, and I'm on the floor and it hurts. <laughs> and that kind of way of thinking meant that when I was reading those comics, I was going, but I don't believe it. I don't believe that punching solves anything. One of the things that I love in the whole of Sandman, um, I think he maybe even so much as touches maybe about four other people. And mostly it's occasionally holding hands, you know, there's one holding hands in Sandman Overture that I love doing. Because the whole point of him is he's just alone. He doesn't touch people. And he definitely doesn't hit them. Yeah, no, you, the fight scene, the kind of Marvel movie fight scene, it's not present. I mean, when you think about the average person when they've watched superhero movies, you know, these kind of comic book movies, a good half of what they're watching are just fight scenes. And so, which is why I, you know, I would fast forward through that stuff, <laughs> which is probably like somebody admitting that they would fast forward through all of the sex in a porno movie, um, <laughs> just to get the plot. You know, the plot for me is, is the interesting bit. And so that was huge in Sandman, um, the idea that might would not make right, might would not make anything very much, and consequences of your, you know, things, things have consequences. Um, I was much more interested always in figuring out how events affected people than in what the events were. And even in Overture, I think Overture, one of the things that, for me, that's really striking of how it kind of loops back in and basically starts sort of the kind of one of the, the big themes of it is duty, responsibility. Yep. I mean, it's interesting that often the, again, when I think about the, the sort of the incredible impact that Sandman had when those first issues were starting to circulate, where we had often, you know, duty, responsibility was sort of just a fiction and alibi that would got thrown around in sort of mainstream comics as just an alibi so that you could sadistically, you know, oppress people or sadistically be people. But you were really interested what duty really means and what responsibility um, demands of people. I, it, it began to obsess me while I was writing it and it became, um, the interesting thing about Sandman was all of the grand themes of Sandman evolved very organically. And I think some of that had to do with the rather wonderful pressure under which it was being written. Um, for me, writing, a, I, I do not think I was designed to write monthly comics. If you're <laughs> writing a monthly comic, you have to be absolutely happy to just be under a ridiculous amount of pressure because if you don't write it, the artist, letterer, colorist, and quite possibly your editor will not eat. <laughs> um, so you write it, and very often you don't stop to think. You cannot second guess yourself. Um, mostly you can't even fix things. You are writing in a kind of ongoing first draft that you can you can noodle with and change things and fix things till the moment that it is published, but the moment that it is published, it is set. It is in stone. And now everything else you use, you're, you know, even if you made a rather odd shape, that odd shape has to fit into the wall. 
that you are building. Um, you can't change it if you... Okay, so I'm going to tell you a trade secret here of being a novelist. Get the pens out! <laughs> if, apart from the fact that you are allowed to write in your pajamas, um, nothing is set until your book is printed and nobody's ever going to read your first draft but you. And that's brilliant because that means that you can have characters, they can change gender, they can change race, they can stop being a robot and become a table. <laughs> um, when you get to chapter 19 and you realize that you just, if you just had a ray gun in that umbrella stand in chapter one, the whole book would work. You just go back and you put, an umbre put the ray gun in the umbrella stand and the book works and everyone goes, you are brilliant. You knew what you were doing the whole time. And that's what you can do in a novel. You cannot do it in a monthly comic because everybody looked in that umbrella stand and there was no ray gun there. <laughs> so you are always building with what you have and you are trusting yourself um, because you have nothing else to trust. And for me, the themes of duty, um, the themes of responsibility, the idea that you always have the freedom to walk away something um, but some people can't the idea of you know essentially the, the the giant theme of Sandman which somebody asked me I, I talk about this in I think the introduction to endless nights somebody asked me in Italy if I could sum up the plot of Sandman in 25 words and I said come wow. on this is this is you know 2,000 pages and they said 25 words and I said okay well you know the Lord of Dreams discovers uh, you know the Lord of Dreams learns that he has to change or die and he makes his decision and that was an incredibly unfair summary um, but at least it kind of encapsulates what it became about it becomes about change or you know the idea of how much can you let yourself change and you don't give them an easy out no, oh. <laughs> you must not give your characters easy outs. Um, although I would always build them in. I would, I would build in, I even did it while I was writing Overture. There would be places where I'd go, oh, you know, I will build in a little a parachute here if he needs it. I'll build in an escape hatch here if he needs it. And knowing that I had an escape hatch, I then wouldn't use it. And I would go, I would do whatever it was that I planned to do, but it always made me more comfortable knowing that if I wanted to get out, I could. I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily apocalyptic beginning slash ending, yeah? I mean, you sort of slay the universe in it. It was really interesting, writing Overture, I had this, this thing in my head um, that was at a very peculiar shape, kind of like an infinity symbol. Um, because what I wanted it to be was the strip, it was like the part that I could plug in to the end of Sandman and loop it round to the beginning. And you would read it if it worked. You'd read it and then you'd come back to Sandman. And now, if you read Sandman again, and I was assuming that the people who were buying Overture, at least at that point, had read Sandman, what they would encounter would be different. What they would encounter, they would understand the motives of characters whose motives they had not understood before. They would understand why Morpheus was behaving in ways that he behaved. There are places where if you read it the first time through, there are points in the doll's house where you go, oh my God, he's being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, hopefully, if you've read um, Sandman Overture and you got to that point in the doll's house, you're going, you are not being a dick, 
but will you please be the dick you need to be because otherwise this whole thing is going to be trouble again and you know so you'll come into things from a different angle and that was what i was hoping i would do i didn't want to do the thing that made the thing that i had done less and i had seen in the, in the early 80s, in the mid 80s, um, a lot of science fiction writers would go back to books they had written um, 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier, and write sequels. And the sequels just made everything worse. <laughs> you know, there's that point where you're reading it and you're going, I was saying this in the press conference today, that, that point where you go, no, look, the robot books are this, and the foundation books are that, and you don't... It, no, why would you... Yeah. And it's, that, it's that kind of thing. You go, this is a, this is a huge mistake. Um, I wanted it to be something that people would read that would add value, that would make Sandman more interesting. And yes, it would answer questions that I had left unanswered, but hopefully it would create new questions that would actually be even more interesting than the old ones. So that was, that was my master plan. Um, and with the time, when I think about the time that, you know, we started talking about the years that have passed since those, those first issues, where, where are you with Sandman? While you were writing it and even now that it's all, it's all done. I mean, where are you? Like, what's your relationship with Dream? Oh, they're all still in there. That was, that was the strangest and best thing about writing Overture, and it was also the scariest, was sitting down to write it and going, you know, I last wrote Sandman as a monthly comic in 1996. Here I am, whatever I was at that point, 17 years later. What if they're not in there? What if I go to write Sandman dialogue and it feels like I'm making it up? What if I need to write some delirium lines and she's, she's not there and she doesn't say the lovely, wonderful, funny things that she used to say? What if they'd gone? And what was the most reassuring thing was they were still there. Dream was himself. He would occasionally be gloriously irritating, even to me. And it was great. The point where I was writing um, delirium in the last issue, and I finally get to write some delirium, and she starts talking about pigables, which are sort of like pigs and sort of like vegetables. And I'm going, still her. <laughs> Nobody else is gonna say this now. It was, it was really weird. It was like, they're still part of me. Whatever parts of me they were when I was 26, um, are still there, which actually is rather wonderful. It's the idea, now I'm going, oh, okay, I could probably write a 50th anniversary Sandman story, you know, 25 years from now, I, if DC came to me, they'd, they'd still be there. It would be okay. And there's still stories to tell. Um, death, though? How about death? I mean, I remember reading Death when I was a kid, you know, and my, this, had this grandmother, and she, you know, always spoke in these weird ways about things, and she, she would say to me things like, yeah, when you're a young person, death lives in another town. When you get my age, death is a roommate. Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I used to listen to her when I was a kid. I was like, oh, okay, abuela, sigue hablando. And I would just be like, okay. But even now, when I was reading Overture, I realized my relationship to death, the character, has altered. Yeah. Did you find that? Yes and no, because the part of you that is a writer is always much smarter than the rest of you. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the part of me that was a writer got to say things that were true and big and real and important, even if he wasn't quite sure that that was true. Even if, you know, yeah, death was something that happened to other people. And I don't know that now I would be able to create a character like Hob Gadling, who doesn't die, 
because his opinion is that death is a mug's game and people only die because they go along with it, so he won't. <laughs> and you get to watch him going up and down and his life and, and he just doesn't die. Um, I don't know if I would create somebody like that now, but I love that I did then and I love that the character death um, for me has just, she's just deepened. She's there still, I love, I love the fact that over the years people have come up to me and said, death as a character, actually thinking about her got me through the death of my parents, the death of my loved one, the death of my child. Um, and I'm just really pleased, I'm really grateful that I gave them a fiction that allowed them to shape the world and perceive the world in a way that somehow made it more hospitable. Yeah, and she appears in issue eight for the first time. Is that like sort of narrative sort of true that those first seven issues, they were trying to, the comic was fi trying to find its footing, um, you know, sales wise and even perhaps in its story. And then when the issue with death, when she appears, that wonderful single issue, which Paul Levitz considers the single best issue in, of, of any comic run ever. Is it true that, well, it's Paul. <laughs> Damn Paul Levitz, man. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. He considers it the single perfect comic issue ever. And that, that when she appears and the endless coalesce, that that's when the comic gets its footing. Is this rumor, this sort of gloss on the history even remotely accurate? It's true in that I look at Sandman 8 and it's the first one of them in which I don't sound like anybody else. I found my voice. I can point to the early issues and I can say, okay, issue one, I'm doing Dennis Wheatley. I'm doing issue three, I'm doing Clive Barker and Ramsey Campbell. Issue two, I've got a lot of early DC comics and EC comics and things like that going on. Issue four, it's vaguely inspired by, of all people, Robert Heinlein's Magic Incorporated. And uh, you know, issue five, and I'm trying to do, do Alan Moore here and I've got all of these other voices going on in my head and I'm trying to write things and I'm grabbing things which at least in my head, not necessarily in anybody else's, look and feel like the thing I'm trying to get down on paper. And then Sandman 8, nobody had written anything like that. No. <laughs> and nobody had written a mainstream comic in which nothing happens <laughs> like that. I mean, you know, the plot of Sandman 8 is he's a bit dejected and he goes for a walk with his sister and cheers up a bit. <laughs> that is the plot. And that Karen Berger let me do that, that she had faith in me to let me write that story without saying, you know, wouldn't it be better if they, something happens, you know, you, shouldn't you have an evil criminal who gets thwarted or, or anything? Um, it's like, no, some people die and it's, it's not even really sad, it's the thing that happens. Um, that, that sounded like me and it was my comic and suddenly I had a voice. And I think, I mean, I think it's true for any young writers. When people ask me, you know, how do I get a voice? How do I get a style? How do I sound like me? The answer is you write. You write lots and lots of stuff and eventually you'll sound like you. But they, they, you can't help it. But you have to write the other people out of your head first. And yeah, Sandman 8 was me. Yeah. Yeah, it was, I mean, when I think about that issue and I think about, again, having me so young and reading, you know, Sandman and reading you, it was like as if Def just, that issue showed you the way. Yeah. It's like you never looked back. It was you all the way. I didn't, and I didn't. Suddenly, it was no longer a horror comic. You know, in the first eight issues, it was... That was, the, that was the box I was in, I was a horror comic. After that, horror became a condiment. <laughs> Something I would use occasionally when it needed it. It would add, add zing to the dish. Um, but it was whatever I needed it to be. And 
if I decided to go and do a story in the French Revolution or a story about ancient Rome or tell the world about the emperor of the United States in San Francisco in the 1860s, I could do that. And, you know, DC Comics at that point were going, well, it's selling. <laughs> he seems happy. <laughs> um, I was lucky. I was, I was, I don't know that it would have necessarily happened at any other time in human history. It needed a whole bunch of things to happen. It needed me to have met Dave McKean. It needed the artists that we had to, to work the way that it did. Um, it definitely needed Karen. And it needed DC Comics to be what it was at that point, which was a kind of a, we're number two, but we try harder <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. And the confluence of all of that actually let Sandman happen. And I can never be, you know, I look back and I go, this is a miracle. Because I don't think, if, if you tried to do something like that now, I'm not sure that you could. You'd have to do it in another way. Um, but the idea of making it happen through a mainstream comics publisher, I think would be much, much harder. Oh, I would, you know, I was thinking you just recently, this year you did a, a um, sort of this, uh, I think it was, a, it was a BBC piece on Orpheus, yeah? Um, I think you even talked to Chip Delaney about it, yeah? And I'm thinking 2015, you're talking about Orpheus. You start with Dream. It seems without any question, the mythic has been a central inspiration for you, a central preoccupation. I mean, you could even say a lot of the work is trying to make an argument for the centrality or the importance of the mythic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, I was a kid who loved myth. I was a kid who responded to myth like nothing else. Um, you know, I loved books, and I loved the Narnia books, but what I loved in Narnia were the moments of the eruption of myth the naiads, the dryads, the fauns, Bacchus coming through. I loved um, Roger Lancel and Green's Tales of the Norsemen, Tales of Ancient Egypt. Uh, Chip Delaney's book, The Einstein Intersection, I read it when I was eight or nine. Much, much, much too young for that book. <laughs> and 90% of it went over my head. But I, I knew enough about myth to know that I was reading a retelling of Orpheus, and I knew the story of Orpheus, and I knew that this story about Lobi and Kid Death was somehow some kind of Orphic retelling, which made this book important, which meant that I needed to crack it, which meant that I needed to go back and reread it every few years and find out if I understood it yet. Um, it meant that when I discovered writers like Zelazny and watched them reconfigure myths in books like Lord of Light, it was huge and it was important to me. And it meant that when I finally got my hands on a work of fiction and an audience, I was going to cram myths down their throats, whether they <laughs> liked it or not, because now I had the power. Um, <laughs> And because also I thought myths were important. I, and I still do. I think myths are the ways that we used to make sense of the world. And now the ways that we make sense of the world become the modern myths and the myths of today. And what do you think is the ultimate? Is it restorative? I mean, is it that they explain things? Why do you continually return? Not just because it's an inspiration. I mean, at the core, what did myths do for you? How do they, what did they organize in you? And what do you think your, you know, your mythopoeia has been for other people? I think myths gave me ways, well, actually the great thing about myths for me was the multiplicity of myths. Because what myths gave me was a kind of peculiar intellectual freedom. And when you are five or six, when you're nine or 10, when people around you are saying, this is how you have to see the world. 
The fact that you can sit there and go, okay, well, as far as the ancient Greeks were concerned, this is what the sun was. But as far as the Norse were concerned, it wasn't that at all. And for that matter, it was being pursued by wolves. <laughs> and, you know, the fact that you can take the ancient, you start to have a head full of creation myths. And you can go, okay, well, if, if this is just a creation myth and this is a creation myth, then maybe this other stuff they're telling me, that's just another creation myth. And maybe this other stuff over here is another creation. And actually, all of this stuff is story. And it's story which makes it powerful. It doesn't make it less real because it's story. It makes it very real for people and it makes it a way to see the world. And, and that, I think, as a kid and as a young man, and probably as an adult, was the most liberating thing about myths. Because you're going, there are ways that people have defined the world to each other. There are ways people have explained the world and existence to each other. And that they all contradict each other is fantastic. Because it means that everybody is full of shit. <laughs> and, but it also means that everybody has, you know, in that kind of blind man and the elephant way, some kind of handle on truth. Thank you, Neil. I was going to give you one last question because we're in Brooklyn, right? It's like the most... I mean, if you just look at the diversity of your audience, and it doesn't even begin to touch the diversity of Brooklyn, I was just going to read a little bit because you're a creator that sort of isn't it, it's an unusual you take an unusual stance, a sadly unusual stance. With comics, you, you well know, um, comics and superheroes have been wrestling with the question of diversity a really long time. And they're wrestling with it rather poorly in some cases. You know, now, you touched on how one of the things that happened with Sandman is that uh, you created this vast audience that hadn't been there before, and it was like literally brought in an enormous amount of women re readers. And I was gonna just read something that you were, you know, a quote of yours. I hate to do this to artists, but I just thought it was better than me awkwardly phrasing a question, yeah? <laughs> and I'm just struck by it because so many folks are like, well, you know, I'm all about diversity, but when it comes time for the movie, make the characters all white. <laughs> I don't give a fuck, make my check, give me that check. But you're quoted, yeah? talking about uh, your books, one of your books specifically, um, but it even goes into American Gods, and the quote is this. Um, that was something I found deeply problematic with attempts by some people who had a lot of money and a lot of clout and who wanted the rights to Neil's novel, Anansi Boys, at one point. Somewhere in there, they made the fatal mistake of saying to me, and of course the characters won't be black in the movie because black people don't like fantasy. They were suddenly very surprised that we were no longer interested in selling them the book. So, <laughs> Neil, talk to us. I mean, I, I'm, I think that is the shit right there, but <laughs> I'm, talk to us, Neil. It's, no, it's true, and one of, for me, the best thing, we're currently working on an American Gods TV series. I've got some, um, we're doing it with uh, the Stars Network and a wonderful, um, glorious Brian Fuller, um, who is best known for Hannibal, I suppose, these days, is, is show running it. And my bottom line, when I did the initial deal and that we've held in place ever since, is I said, you can absolutely do the novel, but um, the racial breakdown in the novel stays. And, you know, Shadow, our hero, is mixed race. I want you to find me a mixed race actor. Um, all of the characters, you know, they represent America, and they represent the glorious 
messed up, mixed up wonderfulness of America and that I want in there. And they were absolutely, we got no argument from, from the TV companies, no argument from the network, and no argument from Brian and, and his guys. And I, it's been wonderful for me getting sent, you know, audition tapes from all of these fantastic actors going, and I look at them and I go, you're all brilliant. And one of you is gonna be the lead and that will be, that will be great. And I just love the fact that we are opening things up a little bit. Um, no, that, that for me is, is huge and important, I think. You know, diversity in all things. But so the, the best thing about people is we're all different. We're, we're, we're this magnificently different bunch. You know, look around you. There's nobody else even vaguely like you in this room. For many of you, there's nobody with the same color hair. <laughs> um, that's wonderful. That's awesome. And that for me, you know, when I was writing Sandman, people talk about the big stuff and the gods and all that. For me, a lot of the joy of writing Sandman was putting my friends in, um, putting people like the people that I knew and was hanging around in. So, uh, you know, there were gay characters in there, there were trans characters in there. That was, it was important to me because, not because at that time I had any kind of idea of this is, you know, I'm going to increase diversity in comics because there wasn't any kind of notion of that. It was just, my friends don't get into comics. People like my friends don't show up in comics. I'm writing a comic, I can put them in. Uh, I think for many of us, we belong to communities where we're so used to being erased. Just even if we're the central character of a book or we're the central character of a story, even in real life, you, the story can be about Asian Americans, but when it comes to movies, they will suddenly every character be white. And my question is that we don't often encounter someone who holds the line like you, Neil. And so, where did that come from? Where did that ethics come from? Where did you realize that, like, no, I'm not going to sign this shit away? Uh, I mean, it stands out, Neil. It stands okay. out. Um, you guys, it stands out. <laughs> so, when. Okay, this is gonna sound hokey and stupid, but it is, there, is, there is probably some truth in it. When I was little more than a boy, I wrote a biography of Duran Duran. <laughs> and I wrote it for the money. I was, you know, my rent was 25 pounds a week. Um, I, I, it was a long time ago. It was a very small room, um, but it was 25 pounds a week rent, and I, you know, they gave me 2,000 pounds, and I had a good royalty deal, and I went off and I bought a, I bought an electric typewriter with the money from from the Duran Duran thing, and and I spent three or four months writing the book, and I handed it in, and it came out and it sold out in its first week and the print run was gone and they were about to go back to press and I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I know that they did so many books, which means that my royalty, oh my gosh, I'm actually gonna make some money. This is amazing. And the company, Proteus Books, went into involuntary liquidation um, the following week and I never saw any more money of any kind. And I looked around and I went, that was really interesting. <laughs> I did it for the money, and I didn't get the money. <laughs> and I wrote a book that, however good, good the book was, was not a book that I actually would ever have wanted to read. <laughs> and I only have so much time in the world, and I wish I hadn't done that. I thought, okay, what can I take from that? And I thought, well, I, you know, I don't think I'm gonna do things for the money. I will do things because they're interesting, I'll do things because they're fun, I'll do things because they seem like something that might last. I will follow the stuff that I want to do, and 
I will let the money take care of itself. And overall, and that, that hasn't worked a thousand percent of the time, but it's worked mostly. And what's nice is it's meant that I've done stuff which any rational person would not have done. Um, once American Gods was published, my agent got a letter from a publisher who wanted me to come with them, basically saying, you know, look, we, we love Neil. His career has been a bit all over the place so far. American Gods is great. What we want is to offer him a lot of money to come to us and write books like American Gods for the rest of his career. <laughs> and, and my agent phoned me up, read me the letter, and said, I wasn't even going to bother sending it over to you. And I said, that was quite right. And the next book I handed him was Coraline. <laughs> um, you know, which, which nobody was waiting for. Nobody wanted, and we had no idea whether anybody would want to read a scary book for small children, let alone whether small children would want to read a scary book for small children. It wasn't. So the doing things for the money bit, um, I am incredibly lucky. What I've done is done the stuff that I wanted to do, and the money has followed, and when it hasn't, I've at least had something that I'm really proud of having made. And so when I got the Hollywood people saying, well, we love a Nancy boys, of course, they can't be black. It's like, well, then you can't have the book because that's my book and I love it. And I love the fact that these characters are Anglo-Caribbean. I love the fact I had more fun in that book identifying white characters whenever they came on <laughs> than it shouldn't, you shouldn't put it down as fun, but it was just so much fun. You know, anytime a white character was in the book, I would say they were white. And That's sort of how I live my life, yo. Know. <laughs> no. Brilliant. I, but I, but I also love, but I also loved that because that's something I couldn't have done in comics. Right. In comics, you can see people, so you know immediately what skin color they are, and you know what their ethnicity is because they're in your comic. Um, in Anansi Boys, you are going to have to figure it out from the text, and. Sometimes people have been halfway through that book and then they put it down and go, oh my God, everybody's black. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. I love that. It's wonderful. Well, we're going to finish with the last, the bonus round question from uh, audience. This actual question, uh, we sent stuff out and this actual question came uh, over the wire from uh, Mexico City, you guys. It actually came through my sort of email sent out. Uh, a friend of mine who was reading you uh, back in the day, and this, the question was straightforward, simple. Does death ever come to you in your dreams? What a beautiful question. Um, She's brilliant. I, I have never dreamed of death. I have dreamed on a couple of occasions of dream, the Sandman. I dreamed of him, and on one very, very peculiar occasion, I dreamed what it was like to be him. In my dream, I was him. And what fascinated me most was what his eyes felt like. I'm going, oh, that's, that's what they feel like. I always wonder what it would feel like to look out of those things, because they're just, they aren't really eyes, they're pits. And that's what it looks like. Um, it was a very peculiar dream in which I was being pursued through some kind of ancient castle by something that looked a lot like spaghetti. Um, <laughs> All the Freudians out there going, oh, hi, yes. <laughs> the Morpheus and spaghetti dream, of course. Um, so, but I've never dreamed of death, and I think that's probably a good thing. Mm. Um, and it, I think the best thing about death is she definitely, writing her, changed my attitude to death. Um, and it changed it a long time ago. I, I remember the last time my baby is hiccuping. That is so cute. Um, I remember the last time I was actually scared to die. 
And it was in 1988, December 1988, and I was getting on a plane, I was on a plane to America, and I was carrying with me all of the art for Dave McKean's Black Orchid, which he could not afford to send and had not had shot in any way. There was no, there was nothing. I was carrying it. And I also knew that we were only three issues in to Sandman at that point. I'd written it, them, they, but they hadn't been published. And I thought, if this plane goes down right now, Black Orchid will never be published. DC will probably never publish those three comics because they'll go, oh, this is, and nobody will ever know what this thing could have been, this giant, grand, weird, Sandman-shaped thing in my head. It will never happen. This plane will go down, and it will, it will be as if I have never been. And I was absolutely terrified. Um, and actually was, was slightly more terrified the week later when Exactly one week later, the, the Lockerbie bombing, the plane, fly, Pan Am Flight 005 was the flight that I'd come over on a week before, and it actually did go down. I thought, oh, okay, missed one there. Um, <laughs> but that was really the last time I remember being afraid of death. And whatever that says about me, I don't know. I'm definitely not you know, afraid of pain. I'm afraid of bad things happening to my children. I'm, but. I definitely felt, having created death, having tapped into this point of view of the character, and having looked at the world through her eyes in order to write her, that it's an incredibly natural thing. You know, you're born, you die. That's the certain stuff. That's fine. That's the way it is. It's all the stuff that happens in between that's interesting. Well, you changed comic books forever with death and with Sandman. So, gang, I'm gonna finish up with two things, just one line uh, as a way of wrapping up and perhaps a no more apt description for Neil Gaiman comes directly from Sandman. Just, uh, just a line, yeah. And uh, Dream is talking. Do you all remember the vortex in Sandman? Yeah, Dream is talking and he says, once in every era there is a vortex even I do not know why, a mortal who briefly becomes the center of the dreaming. Neil Gaiman, thank you so much. <laughs> Number two. Uh, the second and the second and final uh, announcement is that we actually have a special guest here. Um, someone that's going to come up and wants to say some words uh, about Neil. Um, Shelly! Oh, shit! <laughs> hey! Hi, everyone. Neil, there's a rumor confirmed by your four kids, including the one that was hiccuping for the past half hour next to me, confirmed by your wife, your passport, and the internet, <laughs> that tomorrow, Tuesday, November 10th, is not only the in-store date for the Sandman Overture, but it's also your birthday. <laughs> yes, editors have special powers, in case you didn't know that. So on behalf of DC Entertainment's President Diane Nelson and co-publishers Jim Lee and Dan DiDio, we present you with this original final page of Salmon Overture number one to herald this epic book release birthday occasion. Now, if only I could carry a tune. <laughs> I said, now, if I, only I could carry a tune. I saw none of this coming. I am so stupid. <laughs>
Uh, can you hear it? Is it on? No. Can it be on? Can you hear me? Um, I can't believe you don't like Duran Duran. <laughs> On the ukulele. Oh, it's for you. Wait, is this for, okay, got it. You can't hear this, but they can. Um, that's a joke. I'm not going to do that. Um, so I, I, I had this idea that I wanted to um, learn Enter Sandman. <laughs> By Metallica for the ukulele. But the thing that makes Enter Sandman, Enter Sandman, sound like Enter Sandman is the guitar part. <laughs> and this is a ukulele. <laughs> so I emailed Slash and uh, Kurt, the guy from Metallica, and John Mayer. <laughs> None of them could do it. So I'm going to play the guitar part on the kazoo. <laughs> I'm gonna do because I didn't have a chance to learn the rest of it because <laughs> I had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd also like to sing you happy birthday. Um, and I wanted to sing you happy birthday in the dark. And I asked if we could turn the lights out and was told no. <laughs> and then I thought, what would Neil Gaiman do? And I was like, I'm gonna use my imagination. <laughs> So, close your eyes. <laughs> Keep them closed. Okay, everybody else, close your eyes. Okay, does everybody have their eyes closed? Okay. <clears throat> Slice the baby up and give a big to everybody. <laughs> it's a baby. <laughs> I made it myself. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I um, didn't expect any of that. Um, <laughs> One of those moments where I can sort of imagine Alan Moore in the back of my head going, I call you the master of modern plotting. Should have at least seen that one coming. Anyone could have seen that one coming. 
Um, but I didn't. So, so thank you, and thank you, Amanda. And the baby has hiccups again. The fact that you can magnify the hiccups. <laughs> and that J.H. Williams page is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you, everybody at DC. Um, I don't know what we do now. I think somebody is going to, I think probably you should take the baby because that is always, when given the choice, a good idea. And I think somebody is now going to come on and tell us what happens next. <laughs> well, I am expected to follow this act. I mean, this is uh, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Uh, just with, with, with silly instructions again, just to remind you once again, there will be books for sale over here. There will be signed books outside. Uh, stay seated. We'll, we'll call you line by line. But what a phenomenal evening. Thank you so much. So much. Thank you so much, everybody. Folks, if you, if you want to get your book signed, but one more time, not just for Neil, but also for Juno.